who, Paul, would you please start me off with prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to hear your word today. Please send your Holy Spirit on Pastor Paul so that he may speak your words of love, forgiveness, and life. Send your Spirit also on us who hear that we may more fully comprehend your love for us, expressed in the death and resurrection of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. All right. Last week's message title was Brand Name Clothing. And we, we talked about how uh, in a wedding, if you go to a wedding, you've got to have all the right clothes. You've got to look good. And if you go to a wedding, like in that wedding parable that we look at, if you go filthy, they're not going to let you in. They may even kick you out. And the, the part that we need to remember is that that clothing, that filthy clothing is a representation of our filthy deeds, our sinfulness, and we, we can't get to heaven in our clothing. We can't get to heaven in our own works. God gives us a robe of righteousness. He clothes us with something beautiful and clean and perfect. Our task for the week last week was to trust in your robe of righteousness. Trust in the robe of righteousness that God has given to you through the work of Jesus Christ. And the question for the week, is your confidence in your own clothing? Is your confidence in your own works or in the works of Christ covering you with his robe of righteousness? Did anyone have any thoughts or comments on that over the last week? Okay, then we're going to forge ahead um, because this is this is a this is a big message here today, uh, and I, I really did uh, spent some significant time on this. Our our message title for today is Kings and Kingdoms, and the reason uh, that I t entitled this message Kings and Kingdoms because I looked at the readings the the assigned readings for today, and I looked at uh, our calendar uh, at the end of October, knowing that November is coming, and what normally happens on the first week in November? Election, election day, right? And we all know that in the next 12 months, we are going to be inundated with politics. And I thought, you know, maybe this is a good time to talk about politics. Because let me just, let me just ask you this. Who are you going to vote for? Yeah, okay, now don't answer that because I know that some of you said in your mind, you can't ask me that. We get very emotional. We take it very personal. Who are you to ask me who I'm going to vote for? Or perhaps you're on the other end and you're, you're very willing to share your political opinion that that other party doesn't know what in the world they're talking about. You know, they say to have a good, calm conversation, don't talk about religion or politics. So it wouldn't surprise those of you who know me that I'm going to talk about both today, okay? <laughs> there are going to be some things that we may or may not agree with, but I want you to know that, that I mean, I always put a lot of work into my messages, but this, this one... I really did some extra research, and I, I looked at the, the Bible and what our Lutheran Church Missouri Synod uh, says about engagement in politics and, and how, as Christians, we are to be engaged. I looked at Bi the Bible, and I looked at Bible scholars, I looked at what Luther said and, and other biblical scholars, and, and, and I, could, I could preach an hour and a half today, but I won't, Okay? But if you are interested in some of the other stuff that I'm, I'm not talking about today, I'd be happy to share it with you. So let's dive right in and begin by understanding that God has put all authority in place. We talked about it with the, with the kiddos, but it is all from the hand of God. He puts all authority in place, the good and the bad, I want to tell you. We look at Isaiah 45 from our first reading here this morning. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, 
to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you though you do not know me. God says, I anointed you. I put you in this place. You don't even know me. Those people in our world who don't know God still were given authority by God. We need to understand that God is the ultimate authority and all other authority is given by Him. We've also got to understand that having authority is not always an easy job. Okay? And that's why it's important that we pray for those in authority. From 1 Timothy 2, Paul writes, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. We are to pray for all authority. We are to pray for those authority people that we do not like and those that we do like, for those that we agree with and those that we don't agree with. We are to pray for President Biden and Governor Whitmer and uh, President Putin and Benjamin Netanyahu. We are to pray for the authorities, the, the leaders of the Hamas. We don't have to pray for their success, but we are to pray for them. We are to pray that God would touch their hearts, that he would lead them with his wisdom. We are to pray for all authority. God is the ultimate authority, and he gives that authority to men and women. But sometimes we don't agree with that authority, right? We, we, we don't all agree. And I, I know that there are some out there who are saying, yeah, but Pastor Paul, what about this particular person? Well, there are some exceptions as to what we are, how we are to act, but we are still supposed to obey. We are still supposed to honor. We are still supposed to pray for them. Even if it seems like they're, they're, there's no good coming from honoring them or obeying them. For instance, in our gospel reading here today, Jesus was asked, well, should we pay taxes to Caesar? And his response in uh, Matthew 22, verse 21, then he said to them, therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that are God's. This is a time when, when they were, uh, they, if they paid taxes to Caesar, they were supporting the Roman war machine. And if they paid taxes, it wasn't going to go good for them. Jesus said, you still need to pay taxes. You see, there is, there is no biblical foundation for not paying your taxes. We are to support our government, not only with our prayer, but with our taxes. And we are to obey them. We are to be subject to them, even the laws that we don't agree with. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, Love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. We are to honor those in authority. I don't, it doesn't matter to me whether you like President Biden or you like President Trump. It doesn't matter to me which, whether you like the president that we're going to have after this term is done. We are to pray for them. We are to honor them. We are to obey them. 
I, as I was reading and researching, I, I found something that said uh, that we should pray, pay, and obey. Those three things. Pray for them, pay your taxes, and obey the law. Those are the authorities that God has put into place. Now, what about exceptions? When do we not have to obey the law? Okay, And there are some exceptions, but I want to be clear. They are the exceptions, not the rule. We don't just get to choose, pick and choose which ones we, we like and which ones we don't. The first limit to God-given authority, because only God has ultimate authority. He, every authority after that is limited. The first limit to authority is when uh, the, the law tells us something uh, in opposition to God's word. We know that God's word is the truth. Okay, so when the Bible when the Bible tells us this is the right thing and our laws say you have to sin. Then that's a problem. Okay, and there are plenty of examples in the Bible when when good, faithful people said, no, I'm not going to uh, obey that authority. Uh, Peter and the apostles, when they stood before the, uh, after Jesus died and rose again, they, they were told, don't go talking about Jesus anymore. And in Acts chapter 5 through uh, chapter 5 verse 29, but Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. They obeyed God rather than men because they were told not to talk about Jesus. Another example is Daniel in the lion's den. He was told not to pray to anybody except the king. He said, no, I'm not going to do that. He got tossed in the lion's den. Or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, got tossed into a fiery furnace uh, because they were uh, told to bow down and, and worship this golden image. And they said, no, we're not going to do this. Or uh, there, were, there were women in the uh, Old Testament in Egypt that were told to, to kill, the, uh, kill the, the babies, and they said, no, we're not going to do this. Now, I want you to understand something. I would encourage you, if our government says to sin, that you reject that mandate. But recognize that there are going to be some consequences. Daniel got pitched into a lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they got pitched into the fiery furnace. The apostles uh, got beaten and, and had were, all but one were martyred. When you go against the government, it may cost you. But Daniel didn't go into the lion's den whining. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego weren't dragged by their heels into the fiery furnace. If you choose to ignore the authority, there are consequences. Suck it up and don't whine about it. For God's sake. You see, in that last reading, it said, obey for the sake of the Lord, so that when people look at you, they will see that there's something different. Let me catch up to where I am here. The second limit that we want to talk about is when, when uh, authority puts us or someone else in wrongful harm, okay? And I, and I want to clarify wrongful harm, okay? Because there is a sense, like, and this is the, what this slide, is, this picture is about here. If, there's a sense where if, if I am a father and I, my daughter and I, I have to punish my daughter and I say, you're grounded for a week or whatever it may be, there is a sense of harm that is done to her, right? But it's not wrongful harm, that's discipline, there is discipline that goes to wrongful harm. There is abuse, and we need to be careful of that. And, and if there is a, a woman who is being beaten by her husband or a child who is abused by a parent, those people need to flee from that authority. When there is wrongful harm caused by the authority to us or to others, 
one of the words uh, that, that I had never heard before that I, I, I read about as I was doing research was the word quietism. And they used the word quietism in regards to the church during the Nazi regime. That the church during the Nazis didn't stand up and speak out when someone else was being harmed. The church was quiet. When the church is quiet in these kinds of situations, evil runs rampant. When we are being harmed or when someone else is being harmed, we have an obligation to ignore the authority. Now, let me see where I'm at here. There is also the opportunity for Christians to choose to endure that persecution. Okay? You don't have to run. Christians standing up for the right, and I'm sorry I went out of order there, Ali, that's my fault. If, if you are standing up, like, like the early Christians, like the apostles, they were persecuted for standing up for God's truth. Going back to Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the Nazi time. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor in Germany. And he's one that said, we cannot be quiet. But it cost him his life. The Nazis executed him for standing against the, the German, Nazi German regime. There are consequences when we disobey the authority. Okay, the third limit. The third limit we might call driving outside their lane. When the authority tells us to do something that's really not, been, uh, not authority that's been given to them by God. Okay, uh, so we might have, uh, so for instance, in this environment, there is a certain authority that, that I have as the pastor, that the board of directors has, that the, the board of elders have. And the, the government should not come in and tell us what to do here in this, in this environment. They shouldn't tell us who we should baptize and who we shouldn't. This church should not go to Walmart and try and apprehend shoplifters. We're driving outside our lane. Now, there are exceptions to some of these things, where at first we may think that, that government is driving outside their lane. For instance, does the government have a right to tell you what to wear? Well, you would say no, unless you're in the military. If you're in the military, they absolutely have a right to tell you what to wear, and you will wear it. So there are there are some exceptions on both sides, and we need to have an understanding of that. What about our educational system? Does the school have a right to determine what to teach? You know, I know that's really touchy right now. And for decades it has been an issue, and I think it's probably at a peak from where it's been. The, in, in a certain sense, the schools do have a right to, to tell you what they're going to teach. They're going to teach math and science and those kinds of things. But they do not have the right to overrule what parents need to teach their, their children. There's some times when we need to obey the authority, and we, there are some times when the authority is driving outside their lane. Now, Three and a half years ago when COVID started, here at St. John, we made a decision. Governor Whitmer said, you've got to close down all churches. You can't be gathering. And some good Christian said, you know what, Governor? You're driving outside your lane. And I understand that. And, and I, I'll just say... Uh, I, uh, my, my argument, and it wasn't an argument, but I took this to the board of directors and the board of elders, and I said, we don't know what COVID's all about. Nobody really does. And at that moment, my argument was that, that I believe that Governor Whitmer was truly trying to do the best for those people in her care. And I suggested that we should 
do as she commanded or as mandated. Now, you can agree with that or not, and that, that's neither here nor there. But there are times when we should choose to obey or choose to disobey when the government, when the authority is driving outside their lanes. Okay. Now, let me kind of wrap this, this part of it up. I'm not done yet because there's still much to talk about. We need to remember that God, once again, is the ultimate authority. He is the one who is in charge of everything. But it's his authority that has been put into place. And as Lutherans, we, we talk about this doctrine of the two kingdoms. And the doctrine of the two kingdoms, from a Lutheran perspective, is the kingdom of the right hand, uh, right hand and the kingdom of the left hand. Okay, the kingdom, now I'm going to go with right and left, so you're, I'm going to mess you up here, but the kingdom of the right hand is the kingdom of the church, the gospel. God rules in this place. He rules with the gospel. The kingdom of the left hand is the world outside the church. And as you see that puzzle piece there in that picture, those are not completely separate. We talk about a separation of church and state in, in our United States, and, and sometimes I think we get that confused. Separation of church and state is not that they should remain separate, but that one not rule the other. The church should not rule the government, and the government should not rule the church. If we go down that road, then we go back to what uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church was doing in Luther's day. The, the church, the Roman Catholic Church at that time, was in charge of the government. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. We as Christians need to live in both kingdoms. We need to be about the kingdom of the right hand, and we need to be about the kingdom of the left hand. We are to be engaged, and we should be engaged with politics. We should be engaged in our government. We should have Christian politicians, and I do believe there is such a thing. But we should take action. We cannot sit back and do nothing. Now, one of the places that I went to for... Um, where information was our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And there's this, this body in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod called the Commission on Theology and Church Relations, called the CTCR. And I'm going to take a couple of quotes from them. The first one, and this is from the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Christians must resist the temptation to resolve America's church-state problems by attempting to make the state Christian. There are some people, uh, hang on there, I'll get to that one in a second, Allie, you can go back to the other one. There are some people who would say, I'm going to vote for any politician that's a Christian. I don't care what their thinking is, if they're Christian, then I'm going to vote for them. Yeah, that's not what the church, the, our church says. You can't make the government Christian. Choose your leaders on who they are. The, the second uh, quote from the CTCR, where it is not necessary for the church to speak, it is necessary for the church not to speak. For instance, this church should not uh, go out and suggest that we know how to, uh, what's the best way uh, to uh, do the water levels on Houghton Lake. Okay? That's driving outside our lane. We should not, if, it, if it's not necessary for us to speak on the water levels, then we should keep our mouths shut. But we should be engaged as Christians. And this was what Philip Melanchthon, a contemporary of Martin Luther, said. Lutherans, unlike others, do not seek to withdraw from participation in the world, but readily enter it as, it, as the realm in which they live out their lives. See, we are to live in two kingdoms at the same time. We are to live in the kingdom of the church and the, the kingdom of the world. We are to be engaged, but we are not to, to attempt to control the outside world. We are to impact the world outside the church with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because he is the king. 
He is the one who can truly change things. He is the one who, who changes things for you and me for all eternity. And he changes things in the world for all eternity. We've got to share the gospel of Jesus with the world. That's how we transform the world. Let them know that God loves them. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are going to heaven someday because of what Jesus did. And we are citizens here on this earth right now. We are citizens of Michigan. We are citizens of Houghton Lake, Ross Common, wherever. We are citizens of the United States. But our true and ultimate citizenship is in heaven. And that is provided by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's how we change the world around us. Be Christians in a non-Christian world. Transform the world with the love of Christ. Jesus says in Matthew 28, Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey, observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus says, I am the king. I am the one who can change things. And only through Jesus can the world change. The world needs Jesus more than ever. And if we get wrapped up in the, in the ugliness of politics and government, we just look like the rest of the world. We've got to be above that. Jesus died for you, and he died for the world. And it is that gospel that will change the world around us. Okay. Comments, questions, thoughts. You can throw sticks and stones at me later, but just right now, comments and questions and thoughts. Okay. Your task for the week, honor and obey authority. Honor and obey authority, even if you don't like it. And that means don't throw all that crap out there on Facebook either. Okay? Honor the authority. Pray for them. Pray, pay, and obey. The question for the week. How can you impact politics in a godly manner? How can you change the world with the love of Jesus? Denise, will you please wrap us up with prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for being near us in this time. We ask that you would move in our hearts through the message we have just heard. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we might have the courage to be doers of your word and not hearers only. May we be faithful witnesses of the love you have shown us in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Uh, 